All right. Um, so um, we spoke about estimating functional enrichment up until now, which is kind of a kind of a broad uh, question of if you want to understand, you know, genetic architecture, where heritability is coming from, does it come from SNPs in enhancers and coding regions, and how to partition heritability. And what I'm going to speak about now are um, two more specific tasks that we can um, do by leveraging functional annotations. And so the first of these tasks is uh, identifying causal SNPs. And let me give you a brief um, background. So uh, we know that GWASs by themselves identify associations, not uh, actually causal relationships. So here is another Manhattan plot like I showed you in the beginning. And Manhattan plots typically look like this. So again, the SNPs are arranged on the genome and we get these peaks. Um, so we get a peak here and here and here. And why do we get these peaks? It's because of LD. It's because probably we have only one or a few causal SNPs in this peak, but because all of these SNPs are correlated, so they all get significant, a significant p-value. So what we actually want to get is not the associations, but we want to estimate uh, causality. So what we actually want to get is something that looks like this, where here on the y-axis, we don't have the p-value. We have what we call a posterior causal probability, um, which is a common measure, and I'm going to also use the term PIP in this part of the talk. So PIP is posterior inclusion probability, and for some reason this term stuck. Um, so it's a probabilistic measure between zero and one, which asks um, how likely is a SNP to be causal. And you can see that as we moved from uh, this um, figure to this one, the signals became much sparser, right? Its peak, um, sorry, its peak uh, became much sparser, only one or a few SNPs survived. And so hopefully these are the causal SNPs and these are the ones that actually drove the signal in these loci and all the other SNPs, you know, just tagged along because of LD, uh, not really causal. And that's what we want to do. We want to identify these causal SNPs. This is a very important problem. Um, this is actually the, the real goal of GWAS to identify the causal SNPs because this gives us a clue into the, you know, the biological mechanism. And then we can start thinking about uh, treatments or drugs. Uh, pharma companies are really interested in estimating the, you know, these causal probabilities. And so uh, that's what we're going to do um, and speak about in this part of the talk, estimating these causal probabilities. And um, I just say a few words about LD, which is going to play a major role in this part. So LD is, as I say, our friend and foe. So just a few words about uh, why we have LD, because of recombination. So here is um, an example. Let's say that we have a mom and dad and a child. So the child has two chromosomes, one coming from the mom, and that's a mosaic of the mom's chromosome and one coming from the dad. And uh, that's the reason that we have LD, because SNPs that are close by tend to be you know, inherited together from parent to child, and so um, across many generations. And so uh, that means that SNPs that are close by tend to be correlated. If you know that I have an A in that SNP, then I'm probably I'm going to have, for example, a T in uh, a close by SNP. And what does that mean? What are the uh, con consequences of this recombination? So there are um, good news and bad news. So the bad news is that we have often very strong LD between nearby variants, meaning that it's very difficult to identify the causal variant because you know if you have two very correlated variables, then it's very difficult to identify which one is causal uh, and which one isn't, right? By definition, because they're correlated, they look similar. Uh, but the good news, is that we essentially have no LD between distant variants because of the recombination, again, because the process diverges quickly. And that means that if we write down the LD matrix, the matrix of these collations, then it's bended. We're going to get zeros when we get far away from the diagonal, sorry. Um, and this, this is good news. This is good news because it means that uh, when we want to identify a causal SNP in a specific region, we only have to look at this specific region. We don't have to consider SNPs that are far away because they're going to be uncorrelated. They're going to be completely irrelevant for our task of finding the causal SNPs. So um, there are also good news, but um, we do have strong LD within a locus. All right, so um, these were two minutes about LD. All right, so let's get back to our main task of finding these causal probabilities. So what I want to do is called uh, fine mapping. That's the uh, term. So the idea of fine mapping is that we take two things. We take a mat uh, we take GWAS results and we take a matrix of LD, of these correlations between nearby SNPs, and we combine these two things together in a probabilistic model to estimate these causal probabilities that we care about, these PIPs. All right, so that's what we want to do. And um, what one thing that has been known by several people, and we often find that, uh, I should mention that uh, most of the results I'm going to show now are based on uh, my own paper, uh, under review right now, uh, 
So we know that fine mapped SNPs are enriched for functional annotations. So here is a figure from um, our latest paper uh, showing, um, so what we did here is we ran fine mapping on many traits from the UK Biobank, and then we partitioned the SNPs according to these PIPs, these posterior causal probabilities. So uh, blue are very strong confidence, meaning that these SNPs are very likely to be causal, and orange is kind of intermediate confidence and green is weak confidence of causality. And we partition them and then we, uh, I'm showing here the functional enrichment across uh, five representative annotations for these three groups. And we get results that are kind of what we expect maybe. So non-synonymous SNPs are almost 40x enriched. Non-synonymous fine map SNPs are almost 40x enriched, meaning that um, <clears throat> there are 40 fold more non-synonymous SNPs in the PIP gradient point time 0.95 SNPs compared to the average SNP. And we get similar results for conserved, for SNPs and promoters, for hit marks, and we get depletion for repressed SNPs. All right, uh, for repressed SNPs, right? So uh, this gives us a clue that uh, annotations could really guide the fine mapping process. So what we're going to do now is to do the opposite. Instead of first running fine mapping and then asking what's enriched, we are actually going to leverage these functional annotations to improve the fine mapping process. So the idea is that functional annotations can tease apart SNPs in strong LD. And to see that, uh, let's look at this example where we have this spread of DNA and we have these three annotations coding in from the conserved. So we can say without knowing anything that these three SNPs are probably the most relevant ones, right? Because we know that they're coding and they're conserved and they're not in an intron. So a priori, we can say that these SNPs are probably the most relevant ones. And so we want to leverage this information. And here is a cartoon example of how we're going to do that. Let's say that we have this Manhattan plot, and we know that probably one of these three SNPs here in the middle is causal, but we don't know which one. But now let's say that we know that this SNP here in the middle is coding and conserved, and the other two aren't. So this gives us evidence that uh, this SNP is more likely to be causal than the other two, right? So that's what we want to do. We want to leverage these functional annotations to improve the fine mapping process. And so um, um, I'm going to uh, describe a method that we developed called Polyfun that performs fine mapping with polygenic functional priors. And it's not the first method to do that, uh, but it improves over previous methods um, uh, in scalability. So previous methods were limited um, in terms of scalability in one of two ways. Either they could only collect information from a few loci or from a few functional notations. And Polyfun combines lots of recent developments to kind of aggregate information from all across the genome from millions of SNPs to weigh each SNP according, um, optimally according to its annotations, according to hundreds of annotations. Um, and yeah, and we're uh, using hundreds of functional annotations. We could probably use thousands, but we didn't try that. Um, and so um, let me give you a few more details. Uh, so we're going to take a Bayesian framework. So the idea is that uh, we're going to take two things. We're going to take GEOS data, we're going to take these functional annotations data, and we're going to uh, use these two things to estimate a prior distribution of beta i. So for example, SNPs in coding regions, uh, their beta i is probably going to be um, non-zero, right? And then we're going to use the GEOS data again, uh, together with the prior distribution of these betas, to um, get an estimate of the posterior distribution of beta i. So it's a completely Bayesian approach, and for every SNP, we're going to get a posterior distribution of beta i. So I should mention that uh, in contrast to what I showed in the, uh, in the previous part of the talk, now we're actually going to try to estimate these betas directly, not um, just the generative distribution. And uh, I'm, I'm speaking about these betas from uh, that model here on the bottom right. All right, so this is just kind of, you know, um, uh, the scheme of what we're going to do. Um, and I should mention that we're being careful not to use the same GWAS data twice. So we're putting part of the GWAS data aside for the posterior and part another part for the prior. Um, but it's kind of technical and I'm not going to get into the details. Um, so a few more words about Bayesian modeling of genotype phenotype relationships. So here is our model again. And we're going to make an assumption that each beta i, each effect of each SNP can be either zero, meaning it's a null SNP, or it can be normally distributed, meaning it's a causal SNP. And uh, then we have two tasks that we can do. And the first is fine mapping, what I'm speaking about right now, which is trying to identify the non-zero beta i's. Uh, so may maybe, for example, only these three SNPs with the circles are uh, causal. Maybe um, they have non-zero beta i's. And the second task, uh, which um, hopefully I get to speak about in the final part, is risk prediction, meaning that we want to predict the phenotype for an individual based on the genotype. And the common 
task is that we simply want to estimate the posterior distribution of beta i, and then we can uh, use, for example, the posterior means to do these two tasks, right? So fine mapping in, you know, under our model is asking what's the posterior probability that some beta i is non-zero. All right, any questions? All right, uh, so uh, we're going to speak about fine mapping now. Um, so let's speak about uh, the model for one more slide and then we'll show you the results. Um, so here is our model. I already wrote it in English, but now it's written in math. So for every SNP, we have its effect beta i, conditional on its annotations. And um, we assume that it could be, uh, so the generative distribution could be either it's drawn from a normal distribution with some probability pi that depends on its annotations or it's zero otherwise. So we're going to assume kind of a sparse model. Um, and how, now, basically our task is estimating pi, right? If we es can estimate pi, then we estimated the prior causal probability of that SNP, which we need, need to use in our Bayesian model. And so in order to do that, we're going to relate the prior causal probability to the variance. And if you write down the math, it's pretty simple. You can show that pi is proportional to the conditional variance of beta i, conditional instantations. And this is cool. This is something that we already know from the last part of the talk, right? We already have the SLDSC model, which uh, decomposes this variance according to the annotations of the SNP. So now we're back in familiar territory and we already know how to do that, right? So um, if we can estimate these tau's, these annotation coefficients, then we can estimate this um, variance and this will give us an estimate of the prior causal probability for that SNP. So we basically enrich the model from, from before by adding more assumptions. And so again, our problem is that we need to estimate the annotation coefficient tau c and we already know how to do that, right? Um, Almost, I just mentioned that we're not using the regular version of um, SLDSC, we're using a regularized and robustified extension of that method. Uh, and the reason in one sentence is that um, um, this regularization gives us more accurate estimates at the cost of some bias. So it really depends on what's your goal, but in our goal, we uh, are willing to get some slightly estimate bias uh, in order to get more accurate estimates. It's a regular bias variance trade off. And so, um, <clears throat> All right, so um, this was a very brief rundown of how the method works. So um, briefly, what we're going to do um, now, I'm going to show results from our fine mapping and analyzes, which uh, took data from 49 trades from the UK Biobank, uh, which I already mentioned, it's an amazing resource. So the average sample size was 318,000, kind of crazy. And we looked at uh, millions of SNPs uh, with all SNPs with minor relief frequency above some uh, pretty uh, lax threshold. And um, we used 187 functional annotations from a model that we call the baseline LF model that we often use in our group that includes a pretty broad set of coding, conserved regulatory math and LD related annotations. And we analyzed uh, thousands of loci for each trait. And we used a method called SUSY to do the posterior inference um, published or published in Barra Archive in 2018, a really, really good method. So, the idea is that uh, we focus not on the posterior inference by itself, but on getting very accurate prior estimates for each and every SNP so that we, get, we can improve the fine mapping power. So the idea is that again, if a SNP is you know, non-synonymous, then it's a priori more likely to be causal and hopefully that should help guide the, you know, the fine mapping process. And I'm going to show you now an example uh, that should hopefully give you some intuition about uh, how this works. All right, so this is just an example, uh, a real example. So uh, this is uh, a fine mapping of height and we have some locus on chromosome two. So the X axis is just the, you know, the position of the, uh, on this region. And um, for every SNP in this region, we have two shapes. Um, we have a circle and a square. And I should mention that the Y axis shows the posterior causal probability. So every SNP basically has two posterior causal probabilities. One according to the model that uses the function notations, which we call polyphantasosy, and that's the circle and the square is the posterior causal probability without using these functional notations. And all right, and the color of each shape shows the prior causal probability that we estimated based on these functional notations. And so maybe you can already see that there is one slip here, which has pip close to one, meaning that it's very likely to be causal. And we could identify that SNP using our, you know, our model, which uses the functional notations. But the model that does not use functional notations 
it didn't have you know enough confidence to make to say that this this SNP is causal. It gave it stereo causal probability of around um, 0.35. And why is that? Um, because um, it didn't know that it's a non-synonymous SNP. So it's a non-synonymous SNP, and this turns out to be important information. I mean, it's also lots of other things, but in uh, uh, in particular, it's non-synonymous, and this apparently was very useful information. And so this gives you an idea about what's going on. What's going on is that we use these function notations to help us tease apart SNPs in strong LD. Even though this SNP is in strong LD with the other ones, um, it, um, it has enough evidence because we know that it's non-synonymous, and maybe it's lots of other annotations. I, I just thought to write non-synonymous. -non 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 All right? So this is the idea. Function notations can help us tease apart this strong LD. Um, here is another example. It's kind of similar. In this case, the phenotype is red blood cell count. Uh, and the top SNP was in a promoter. And again, this was enough evidence, evidence to make this SNP go all the way to the top. And the model that did not use function notations, even though it thought that this SNP is a good candidate, it wasn't confident enough about it. In fact, it wasn't even the top candidate SNP according to the, you know, to this method, that the the one with the squares, all right. So this is the idea, um, and so we ran this fine mapping method on uh, lots of traits, and in total we found 32 percent more fine map SNPs uh, than non-functionally informed fine mapping. So using functional notations turns out to be a pretty big deal in this case of fine mapping, and here you can see a breakdown of how many SNPs we found per trait. Um, it's less important. Um, but the bottom line is that um, we found around 3,000 SNPs. And um, what you can see here is a visualization of all the SNPs that we found on the genome. Um, so every circle here is a SNP that was confidently fine mapped for at least one trait. And um, I guess the most interesting thing that you can see here is that um, whenever you see a bunch of circles next to each other, it means that the same SNP was fine mapped for multiple traits that are genetically uncorrelated, um, meaning that there is a technical definition, but it means that basically they have very different uh, uh, genetic architectures. And uh, we found some SNPs that were really pleiotropic for lots of different traits. For example, this SNP uh, was fine mapped for um, height, BMI, waist hip ratio after adjusting for BMI, red blood cell count, total cholesterol, blood pressure, lung capacity, and balding. These are really distinct traits. I mean, they, they have very little to do with each other, and it was fine for all of them. So this gives us insight into what maybe are you know, the um, really important SNPs that play a role in very fundamental biological processes. Um, so there's lots of info that we can get from this um, from this fine mapping. Um, and I think that for time constraints, I'm just going to finish this part of the talk and just skip the third part. Um, I think otherwise it's going to be too rushed. Is that fine? Actually, because right. it's a recorded video, I think we should just record everything and students who has to go to another class can still go, but I would, at least for myself, would love to hear the rest of your talk. Oh, all right, that's okay. great. Um, fine with you. <laughs> all right, sorry for that. Um, always difficult to get to manage the time. All right, um, so I briefly want to show you um, something um, else that we can do with our Bayesian framework of the fine mapping called polygenic localization. And this kind of ties together um, the fine mapping and um, what we did in the previous part of the talk, which is about partitioning heritability, asking how much heritability is coming from you know, SNPs encoding regions and so on. And so we tried to bridge these two things together and we came up with the concept of polygenic localization. And the idea is that we're going to uh, quantify how much heritability is explained by the K SNPs with the strongest effect. So once we did this fine mapping, we actually not only did fine mapping, we actually estimated the posterior distribution of the effect of each and every SNP. And now we, we know which SNPs are the strongest, which ones are the second strongest, and so on. And this really gives us a clue about how many SNPs um, you know, explain a given proportion of heritability. And in this case, we're going to use the annotations indirectly um, because we already used them when we did, when we did the posterior inference. Right, and so just a very few uh, words about how we did this polygenic localization. Um, so um, <clears throat> one thing that we cannot do, we cannot just take uh, the polyphon estimates. So um, 
<laughs> naively, we can just take the estimates of beta i or beta i squared, the magnitude of beta i from uh, what we already did and use them to rank the SNPs. But we can do that because of a common statistical phenomenon called Winner's Curse. And Winner's Curse basically says that you should never rank items and then do statistical inference on the top ranked items um, using the same data. Because these top ranked items are, you know, they got, some of them got lucky by accident and that's why they're top ranked. And so your estimates are going to be biased. And so instead, uh, it's kind of technical, we use a separate data set uh, to be you know, absolutely confident that uh, we're unbiased. So what we did is we estimated this bit I squared, the magnitude of the effects of each and every SNP uh, using our method polyphon. And then we partitioned SNPs into bins of similar bit I squared. And then we re-estimated the irritability in each bin using our favorite method, SLDSC, but using different data. And in this case, we used basically all of the European individuals in the UK Biobank that we didn't use in the original fine mapping analysis. Uh, it's kind of technical, but anyway, we use different data. Um, and one question that we thought would be interesting to do is to ask how many SNPs does it take to explain 50% of the heritability? So H squared G is heritability. Um, across different traits. And the answer is that it really varies widely across orders of magnitude. So you can see here that uh, the range goes from less than 100 for hair color of, all the way to over half a million for chronotype. Chronotype is a property of being a morning person, whether you're tired in the morning. So uh, it's a very polygenic trait. Unfortunately, you can fix that. Um, and yeah, there is a huge range here. And um, this really gives us an insight into which traits have a more complex biological architecture than others or genetic architecture than others. And so this all fits together into our posterior inference framework, which uh, gains a lot by using these functional annotations. Um, and one other thing that we can do with this is uh, we can actually look at individual traits and ask how much heritability accumulates across the genome as we add more and more SNPs. So what you can see here is, I'm going to show you three examples. So on the x-axis, we have um, the number of top ranked common SNPs for, in this case, hair color. And on the y-axis, we have the proportion of common SNP heritability that is explained by these SNPs. And you now when you look at this, it looks like we need zero SNPs to explain 50% uh, of the irritability of hair color. But if we zoom in on where most of the action is, so we can see that it's not really zero. It takes 25 SNPs to explain 50% of the irritability of hair color. So for hair color, we got very strong polygenic localization. Um, but hair color is kind of an extreme example. So if we look at, for example, height, which is a more representative trait, we can see that it takes 3,400 SNPs to explain 50% of the heritability, which I still think um, is a really interesting result. Um, height is considered a really polygenic trait. It's kind of a textbook example of a polygenic trait. But what we're showing here is that it takes only, you know, way, way, way less than 0.1% of the genome to explain most of, you know, the genetic signal of height. So we think that's a really interesting result. Um, and again, we have a range of traits for, uh, the trait for which we got the weakest polygenic localization is chronotype or the property of being a morning person. And um, here you can see that according to our estimates, it takes more than half a million SNPs to explain 50% of the irritability. So there's really a huge range here. And uh, all right, so that's it for the second part of this talk. So uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. I think for the time, maybe we will um... All right. Continue with the next section. I'm going to stop the recording and restart again. All right. And, you know, depends on whether we have time at the end. Is that All okay? Right.